Welcome. So just so you know, this is the first unit video that only covers BC topics. Let's start by talking about integration by parts. This, like u sub, is another method for evaluating integrals, especially when things are being multiplied, there are inverse trig functions, or there are log functions. Then it's probably the way to go. If you're integrating, u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. A good way to remember the formula is just saying ultraviolet voodoo, which kind of helps you like remember the letters that you're going to use in each of these two parts. Because uh, those, you know, those look fancy invisible ink pens with the ultraviolet light on the end. They're pretty cool. Anyway, so let's use integration by parts to figure out this integral. So we need one part to equal u and the other part to equal dv. It actually does make a difference which you pick, so be careful. The way you decide is by using I late. I've also seen it written as liate, but this is what I use. So yeah, this stands for inverse trig, inverse trig, logarithmic, algebraic, trigonometric, and exponential. So you go down the list, and the first one to appear in your function is u, and the rest of the integral is dv. Here, so in our integral, there aren't any inverse trig functions or logarithmic functions, but we do have an algebraic one here. So that's what we're going to use for our u. Our du, therefore, is 1 dx, or just dx. The rest of the function is the dv part, so e to the x dx is dv, v is the integral of this, or e to the x. Now that, now that we know these four values, we can use our equation. Plugging in this stuff gives that the integral of x e to the x dx is uv, so x e to the x, minus the integral of v du, so the integral of e to the x, and then dx. Now this guy, we can solve this guy. The integral of e to the x is e to the x. So our final answer is x e to the x minus e to the x plus c. That was the simplest type of question you might be asked. Sometimes the v du part, so this part, would be another product, and you have to use integration by parts on that again. Oops, into the beginning. Uh, so something special that might happen is if you have an exponential function being multiplied by a repeating function like sine or cosine. If you use integration by parts on this integral, you get this. Well, it's kind of annoying, isn't it? e to the x cosine of x is pretty much the same thing as e to the x sine of x. So we have to use integration by parts again on this second integral. Okay, let's see what happens then. Right, now we're back to where we started. We have a negative sine x. This is going to bounce back and forth between sine and cosine forever. Is this even possible? Well, yeah, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this blue stuff and plug it in for the integral of e to the x cosine of x. Now, simplify this by bringing the negative out of the sine of x and then distributing the negative sign in the parentheses. Now, notice how we have an e to the x sine of x on both sides. Well, let's solve for it like we're solving for a variable. Add it to both sides, and then divide by the 2. And somehow, out of nowhere, we have our answer. Remember, this is what we wanted to find in the first place? Right, this part is what we're trying to find. We just add a plus C on the end, and we're done. So what we did there was integration by parts twice, and then solving for the integral we wanted by treating it like a variable. Another trick I'll show you is when you have an algebraic thing. You could solve those by doing integration by parts over and over and over again, but this table is a much easier and faster way. The algebraic part, this is going to be our u, and the rest is going to be our dv, the repeating part. So notice that if we keep taking the derivative of x cubed, it's going to eventually become 0. That's when you should use this tabular method. Now let's fill in this table, so x cubed and 
sine of x. Now let me just fill the table by taking the derivatives of u and the integrals of dv. So this is going to be 3x squared, it's going to be 6x, it's going to be 6, it's going to be 0. And then here we're going to have negative cosine of x, uh, negative sine of x, cosine of x, and sine of x. Then on the left hand column, fill in the signs starting with plus and then alternating. Now to get your answer, go one row across and then one row down. Like that. And then now to get so when we just write all this out, we're gonna get negative x cubed cosine of x plus 3x squared sine of x plus 6x cosine of x minus 6 sine of x plus c. That would have been a real pain to do by integration by parts, wouldn't it? Uh, the next topic is improper integrals. These are integrals where the bounds have some version of infinity in them, or there's a discontinuity. For example, on the left graph, if we wanted to find the integral from zero all the way to infinity of this graph, is it an actual number? Well, sometimes it's gonna be yes, and sometimes it's gonna be no. And on the right integral, if I wanted to find the integral from like negative one to one, what's gonna happen? It seems like the two pieces are just gonna cancel out, right? Like this piece and this piece. Well, that's actually not the case. This, this integral actually would not exist. Um, so here's how we would deal with these kind of problems with one of the limits being infinity or we're having a discontinuity. Say we have this integral. I want to find out what happened as the right bound gets bigger and bigger, right? Therefore, I can replace the upper bound with the letter b and take the limit of the integral as b goes to infinity, like this. The limit as b goes to infinity of f of x. For example, in this problem, I'd say the limit as b goes to infinity of that. If you do a u sub letting u is equal to negative 0.1t, this comes out to be the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1000 e to the negative 0.1t and the balance are 0 and b. Um, what I can do now is I'm just going to rewrite this to make it a little bit more obvious what we're doing. So I'm going to take the e and bring it to the bottom over e to the 0.1t from 0 to b. So now let's plug in 0 and b, like we're just evaluating a normal integral. Minus, it's going to be plus 1,000. As b goes to infinity, what happens to this left part here? Well, it's going to be negative 1,000 over infinity, which will go to 0. So that part goes to 0, and we're left with... 1000 as our answer. We each took an integral to infinity, and it would be the same idea if the lower bound was going to negative infinity, the exact same steps. We just have a variable for the bottom bound and we take the limit as it approaches negative infinity. Let's do the same thing with this equation. Even though the bounds are not at infinity, this is still an improper integral because the function has a discontinuity at x equals zero. What we have to do for this is we have to write it as two integrals like this. Since we have discontinuity at zero, I'm going to say we're going to approach zero from the left side. And then we're also going to approach zero from the from the right side. I'm going to use a different, I'm going to use a this time. So we need to put zero from the right side.
the first integral is what happens as the left part, uh, what happens at the left part as the upper bound approaches zero on the left side, and the second one is what happens when the lower bound approaches zero from the right side. Let me draw like a quick sketch of this so you can see what's going on. Like that, and then like this, these two parts correlate, and these two parts correlate. Okay, so now the steps are going to be the same as we did before. Evaluate it, plug in the bounds, and take the limit. If you do all those steps correctly, you're going to get this right here. Let me just write that down. Okay, so as b approaches 0, or as a approaches 0, what happens to the uh, natural log function? Well, it approaches negative infinity. So that means our integral does not approach a finite number, and therefore it diverges. Although it looks like it converges, it actually does not. The final topic now is integration by partial fractions. If you have a rational function on the top and a rational function that can be factored on the bottom, partial functions are a good thing to try. Split the polynomial in two using partial fractions. I'll attach a video in the description by Black Pen Red Pen, who has an amazing YouTube channel, which shows the easiest way to do partial fractions. So you split it up, and you're going to get 2 over x, or the integral of 2 over x, minus 3 over x plus 3. Now each of these two pieces can be integrated separately. So you're going to give us 2, 2 ln absolute value of x, minus 3 ln absolute value of x plus 3, plus c. Currently, the AP test only tests problems with linear, non-repeating factors like that. Another version of the problem you might see is when the numerator has a higher exponent than the denominator. In this case, you first have to use long division to split it into a polynomial and the remainder. The polynomial can be integrated using normal methods, and the power for the remainder will be higher for the bottom than the top, so it can be integrated normally using the same technique of fractions that I just said. For example, in this integral, using long division results in this. Integral of 3x squared plus 5x minus 7 plus integral of 2 over x minus 1. So for this first part, you're going to use the opposite of the power rule. And then for this part, you'd use partial fractions. And then, oops. So for Sometimes a problem looks like it'll use partial fractions, but it really doesn't. Like both of these problems, you can solve them without using partial fractions. Do you see how? Okay, so for the for the left problem, you can do a u substitution with u is equal to the bottom, x cubed plus 6x plus 3. And then for the second one, you can first factor the top and the bottom, and there's going to be a common factor that cancels out. Once the factor cancels out, you can then use a u-sub to solve that as well. As you can see, integration is pretty different than differentiation. There's a lot more options for how to solve the problem. So we basically have like a toolbox of techniques that we can use. And for each problem, we need to decide which tool in our toolbox is the best one to use in the individual case. Okay, so that was the end of the unit. I'm done for now, and I'll see you guys next time.